Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. So today, I want to continue with this introduction to projective geometry. And what I want to do is I want to introduce the concept of homogeneous coordinates. So these are coordinates that you can put on projective space, which allows you to calculate and compute in projective space. And the way we'll do that is by looking at projective space in quite a different way. So another way to motivate the concept of homogeneous coordinates and the need for them is that you remember how do we put the geometry on this uh, projective space? Well, the way we did that was we used the manifold approach. So we had various charts. Now, of course, on each of the charts, you have coordinates. So you can work with those coordinates there. And if you're in that chart, then you can use those coordinates. But as soon as you slide off that chart onto a different chart, then you have to change coordinates. So if you don't want to have to keep changing from one coordinate to the other, but be able to work with all patches simultaneously, then the best thing to do is to work with homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so what's our setup? So as usual, there'll be some field that we work over. And remember, what is uh, projective n space? What we do is we look inside affine n plus 1 space, say with coordinates x0 up to xn, and we just look at the set of lines which go through 0. In other words, the set of one-dimensional subspaces. Well, how do you think about a one-dimensional subspace? How do you specify one? Well, the easiest way to specify a one-dimensional subspace is to give a basis vector for it. And what is potentially the basis vector for some one-dimensional subspace? It's just any non-zero vector inside here. So it's just an element of a to the n plus 1 minus 0. Okay, so given such a vector, we can identify it with the one-dimensional subspace it spans. So what we'll do is we'll construct a map phi from this affine n plus 1 space minus 0 to pn, by sending a non-zero vector x to span x. That's the one-dimensional subspace. Now, of course, we can do this, and this will give a surjective map from this set to this set here, but it's far from being injective, so they're very different. Of course, given any one-dimensional subspace, you can pick lots and lots of different basis vectors for it. Okay, so let's see exactly what's going on there. So the question to pose here is, when does span x equal span of x prime? Okay, so this will tell us about the non-injectivity of this map. And of course, the answer to this is, well, it's when they're parallel to each other. So they're scalar multiples of each other. So in other words, x equals alpha x prime for some scalar alpha, which is non-zero. And so for the non-zero scalars, I'll denote this by f cross. Okay. So remember this f cross, the set of non-zero elements in a field, is actually a multiplicative group. Okay. So this multiplicative group actually acts on the whole of this set here by scalar multiplication. And so basically... Another way to formulate this condition here is that this vector x is the same f cross orbit as x prime. So that's going to be a useful reformulation of what's going on here. Okay, so in any case, what we can say is that when th these conditions hold, we write x is equivalent to x prime. And that's precisely the time when the images inside Pn are the same. So that immediately gives us this little proposition here, which is going to allow us to reformulate our understanding of projective n space. So firstly, this relation here is an equivalence relation. And since it's an equivalence relation, we can now partition this set I find n plus 1 space minus 0 into equivalence classes. And of course, what were those equivalence classes? Well, as I just mentioned here, 
these equivalence classes are just orbits inside this set under the action of this multiplicative group here. So we can also write this as I find n plus 1 space minus 0 mod this group action here. And the point is that since the map phi is constant on these equivalence classes, this induces a map from this quotient set to here. And in fact, it's a bijection because it's surjective. And of course, the only times uh, you have span x equals span x prime, that's when 5x equals 5x prime, is when they're equivalent. So this gives a wonderful new interpretation of projective n space. You look at all the non-zero elements inside affine n plus 1 space, and you look at the orbits here under the action of this multiplicative group. Okay, so with this interpretation, it becomes very natural how to present what's called homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so firstly, we're dealing with equivalence classes. Okay, so the equivalence class of any non-zero vector x will denote like this, x0, x1 up to xn, but rather than putting co commas between those coordinates, we're going to put colons. And the reason for that will be clear in a little while. And let me make the definition now. So if you look at phi of x, so that's the span of x, that one-dimensional subspace of affine n plus 1 space. So in other words, it's a point of projective n space. The homogeneous coordinates for that point is just this one here. Okay, so let's look a little look at a little example. Uh, we'll look at P1. So we're looking at one-dimensional subspaces in the plane, and so you can consider something that perhaps goes through uh, 2, 1, so that's a line like that. This represents a point inside P1, it's the span of the vector 2, 1, so that means its homogeneous coordinates are 2, colon 1. Of course, it's also the span of this vector here, given by this point. And so we can also write that this is equal to half, or rather 1, comma, half. 1, colon, half. Okay, so it's a bit funny when you talk about homogeneous coordinates, you have to realize that this it's written one way, is equal to this. That's the first point. The second point is, actually, this tells you why you use the colon notation here. Because you should try to think of this as a ratio, as is usually done when you use the colon. So this is 2 to 1, and these numbers are in that same ratio, 2 to 1. So that's why uh, we use this notation here. And that gives us homogeneous coordinates on P1. So what I want to show now is how homogeneous coordinates are related to all the affine charts that we put on Pn. So this is one of the key reasons why we use homogeneous coordinates, is that it gives us easy access to all these different affine charts. And that means that we can use one set of coordinates to calculate on the whole of projective n space. Okay, so let's uh, consider one affine chart. I'll call that phi 0. And how does that work? So basically, if you're given a point in affine n space, say x1 up to xn, I need to send it to some one-dimensional subspace of affine n plus 1 space. So that's a point of the projective n space. And so I can now write that in homogeneous coordinates. It's just a span of, we insert a 1 in the 0 slot, and then for the other n coordinates, you just put these in there. x1 colon x2 up to xn. Okay? So remember there are n plus 1 of these charts, and they correspond to inserting a 1 in each of the n plus 1 possible slots. And then the other n coordinates just fill up the rest in order. 
Okay, so this is an affine chart which shows you the geometry of a large open subset inside projective n space. The complement was in projective n minus 1 space. And you can ask now precisely in homogeneous coordinate terms, what is the image of this affine chart here? Okay, so of course it's just a set of all points in projective n space which have homogeneous coordinate of this form. But remember, this homogeneous coordinate is the same as the homogeneous coordinate if you multiply by some scalar, which is non-zero. So you can make this one any non-zero scalar you like. And if you think about what the possibilities for the co homogeneous coordinates are for this image, it's the set of all of this where this x0 can be non-zero. So x0 doesn't equal 0 here. That's a nice way to describe the image of this affine chart. And it makes it fairly clear also what the image of all the other affine charts are. You just set the corresponding ith coordinate to be non-zero. Okay, so that gives us a way of relating these coordinates here on this affine chart with homogeneous coordinates. And the reason why it's easy to work with this is that actually you can go backwards very easily as well. So I want to show you how easy it is to get the inverse map from the image of this chart, so that's u0, back to this affine in space. So how do we do that? Suppose we have some homogeneous coordinates corresponding to something in u0. So that just means that x0 is not 0. Of course, it doesn't quite have this form here, right? So you can't immediately try to figure out what is the inverse image here. But what you realize is that you can pass to the same point in projective space by dividing by this x0. And note that since x0 is non-zero, you can divide by x0. So if you divide all of these by x0, of course, you get a 1 here now. And what are all the other n coordinates here? Well, you have the corresponding xi's divided by x0. So now you can work out where it came from. So to go back means that you have the corresponding point of affine n space. In this affine chart here is x1 over x0. That's the first coordinate all the way up to xn over x0. So the other thing to note is that this also shows you how easy it is to get all the other affine charts. If instead you had the i slot is non-zero, you could divide that by the xi, and that tells you the coordinates on that i chart instead. And it is this fact that it's easy to go forwards and backwards between any of these affine charts and the homogeneous coordinates, which makes these homogeneous coordinates so easy to work with. Okay, so one of the things that underlies why we use homogeneous coordinates is this new way of looking at projective space as the space of orbits inside affine n plus 1 space. And one of the things that you get out of this is this very important result here. And that is that the projective n space, whether you look over the reals or the complexes, is compact in the Euclidean topology. So it turns out, being compact in the Zariski topology is not very difficult because in the Zariski topology, it's so coarse, there are very few open sets. But the fact is they're compact actually in the Euclidean topology. So before I illustrate why this is true, what I want to do is to say why this is important. So if you remember in Bazou's theorem, what's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at projective, the projective plane as opposed to the affine plane? One of the things that we saw is that if we have two lines in, affine, in the affine plane, usually they will intersect in a point, but you can degenerate one by turning one so that they become parallel, and then it may be that they don't intersect anymore. And of course, in the projective plane, we added a point at infinity where they intersect, so this doesn't happen. So one of the things about compactness and why compactness sort of explains what's going on is that as you turn one of the lines, you're looking at a limit of a point 
and it kind of shoots off to infinity and there's no limit there. But compactness means that, well, there has to be a limit out there somewhere. So compactness is a thing which is kind of saying that, well, you don't lose that solution as you s turn one of these lines around and that point sort of shoots off to infinity. Okay? Infinity now is actually a point that exists in this topological space. Okay, so let's kind of see why this is true. And as I said, the way to do this is to view this using the viewpoint that this is a quotient space. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one you have. Your projective end space, let's look over R. You can write as the following quotient. I find n plus 1 space minus 0, and you mod out by the action of the real multiplicative group here. Okay? So if this were complex, you just replace this with the complex. I find n plus 1 space and the complex multiplicative group there. And let's draw it in the case n equals 1. So you just have the plane and you remove the 0. And what does a point in here look like? It's an orbit. So you pick any point here and you scale it by all possible non-zero reals to get something like this. Now, in this case here, it's very easy to see. And in general, it's not much more difficult to see. But you can always scale any point in this orbit so that it has length 1. So it will have length 1, and in particular, it lies on the unit circle. So basically, you, you get every orbit by considering only points on the unit circle, or more generally, the unit sphere. And which points do you identify on this unit sphere? Well, here it's just the opposite ones. And this is true even when n is greater than 1. Which means that you can also view this quotient space as also the quotient space, the n-dimensional sphere, modulo the group, uh, plus or minus 1. And the key point is that this sphere now is compact. So of course this quotient space is compact as well. So that gives you the compactness of projected end space over the reals and the complexes in Euclidean topology. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.